Now, what I'd like to do is we're going to talk for probably 25, 30 minutes around the analytical, uh, around how the pre pre-PCR pre step can introduce variability in your assay and what, what are good ways to firstly identify those, that variability and then also how to mitigate it in the future. And it always comes back to one question that I always like to ask, uh, ask people when I'm talking to them is what is the impact of assay failure in your laboratory and how do you go about monitoring for it? Because that's that's the key. That's the key to the key question to always ask. Because if you, if you're starting to if there's any variability creeping into the assay, then potentially results downstream are going to be erroneous. Erroneous. Now, I, it's a good way to um, to break out the the molecular assay, molecular diagnostic assay, into two parts. You have the pre-analytical step, and then you have the analytical step. On the pre-analytical side. You've got your, you've got your biopsy. You, you're, you're cutting out of a patient. You're, uh, in, you're uh, putting it into a bucket of formalin. You then go through uh, FFP processing. That will then be transferred into a molecular pathology lab where they'll do their uh, DNA extraction. You may then have to store that sample for any time from a few days to a few weeks or even a few months. You then, prior to taking it on to do the analytical side of things. Uh, you'll quantify, quantify the DNA uh, um, predominantly through either a, a nanodrop style uh, machine, a spectrophotometer, or uh, using a fluorometric approach. And that will govern this, pro this side of the process will govern the quality and the quantity of DNA that you get out of your sample. On the flip side, and this is the analytical side, and the analytical side is, is strongly uh, determined by how good the pre-analytical steps were. You'll have your DNA sample. If you're going down a, a next generation sequencing route, you may have to go through some sample, well, you will have to go through some sample preparation route. If you're going down qPCR, you just, have, you just take DNA and do qPCR on that. You do an analysis, and then this will lead on to an actionable decision. Now, if at the starting point, the DNA sample, you've actually over-quantified or under-quantified the amount of DNA you have in the sample, that can have detrimental effects and impact on the actionable results and decision at the end of this process. So what, what I wanted to do is just very, very briefly, and so we've got a whole, a whole different webinar on, on what we do and, and the types of reference science we, we, we make, is the data that, that uh, our guest speaker, Vicky Spivey, will be presenting is using a number of our FFP reference standards. I thought it was important to, to give you a quick snapshot of what our FFP reference standards are. So what we've done is we've taken, we've taken cell lines that we've gene edited ourselves. They've gone through extensive characterization. We've, uh, we've, uh, taken, we've taken cell lines we have mutant wild type to generate an FFP block with a defined allelic frequency. We then extract the DNA ourselves and, and uh, characterize the sections using digital PCR, thank sequencing. Uh, RT-PCR and, and also SNP-6. When we've once we've done that, we then we, we then build a, a, a essentially a, a product report around a reference standard report around uh, each batch. And so there's kind of snapshot data here where on the on the left hand side of the screen you've got a, you've got three different block FFP block that we've made. This is for BRAF 600 k one is one was a 50% allelic frequency for the mutation, and with digital PCR, you have sections of uh, in the middle, uh, the start, middle, and end of the block, and that's and you can see the consistency of the allelic frequency throughout the block. The same is true when you have the 5%, and also when we've generated a 1% and comes in uh, just below 1% at 0.8. The other side, on the other, on the other, on the right-hand side, what we what what it shows is how consistent and reproducible our blocks are. So this is eight different blocks. And what we, we did was take multiple sections from each block and did uh, DNA extractions. And as you can see, the DNA extractions per, per block are very, very cons uh, concise and consistent. So it then comes back to this question I asked at the start. What is the impact of assay failure in your laboratory, and how do you monitor for it? 
obviously we we are we're pushing that uh, adopting reference standards as external controls are an ideal way of, of doing this. Where we have had, where we have been working with partners, particularly with efficiency schemes, efficiency testing, is they that uh, each UA partners have adopted our standards and have actually been able to identify genotyping errors genotyping errors with their participants. Now while while this while the these type of scheme monitor the whole pre-analytical and the analytical uh, step, uh, processes, what you can then start to uh, sort of dive into the detail is and it was it's, it's difficult to show by by the web, with the webinar, but if you take some of the if you take some of the peaks here, so with the EGFR G719X, there were from the participants that looked for this mutation, there was an error rate of over 35%. And if you then looked at what the error rate was, there was an, uh, a large proportion that was false negatives. And if you look at the false negatives, there was actually report, there was reporting that from the sample they had overrepresented or overquantified the amount of DNA that they were they'd actually extracted from from the samples. And that overconcentration led to less less DNA being put into the assay, and so less DNA was then leading to a uh, a false negative result. And so that's where that's where we really feel we can uh, start to help and identify some of these problems as well and mitigate them for the future. Now that's that's my introduction over. I'd therefore like to hand over to to Dr. Vicky, who is our guest speaker for this this webinar, who will take you through a number of a number of data sets where <coughs> our reference standards have been used both internally and also externally. Okay. Thank I'm you. Pretty, oh, I was going to say, if, okay. any, if there are any questions, then please sort of type away um, in the little uh, chat in the little questions box, and we'll answer them. I think in about ten minutes. After time. after my section. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. So I'd like to start um, with an introduction to the main pre-analytical challenges. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the typical workflow for FFP sample processing. And the first challenge starts right at the beginning of this process with differences in sample collection and handling. Different labs follow different protocols for sample fixation and FFP embedding, and these can both influence the downstream processing of the samples. The second challenge relates to the efficacy of DNA extraction. Often with tissue samples, there's only a small amount of uh, material available. And in addition, we know that labs use various different DNA extraction methods, some of which are automated, some are manual, and all can result in different DNA yields obtained. Finally, the third challenge is in the accuracy of DNA quantification, with different methods sometimes yielding quite different results. Over the next couple of slides, I'll discuss these challenges in more detail and show you some of our external and internal study data. So this slide is um, internally generated data, and it demonstrates the variation between five of the commonly used DNA extraction methods. The graph shows different extraction methods employed on the x-axis with a sample number of either 6 or 12 for each method. Each FFP section extracted was the same Horizon FFP reference standard, which Jonathan introduced to you earlier, and they were all quantified using the Quantifloor fluorometric assay. The y-axis shows the amount of DNA recovered as a percentage of the total theoretical yield. And what you can see in this particular data set, the Promega Maxwell platform, okay, it gives the greatest yield from the sections. And this also showed a very high degree of reproducibility across all 12 sections. The take-home message here is that this data highlights that the same samples extracted on different platforms can give quite different yields. So moving on to the next slide, the data presented on this slide was externally generated and highlights the variation this time within different FFP extraction methods. So just to give you a bit of background, 13 molecular pathology labs were recruited and participated in this study. They extracted a total of 104 FFP curls using the five different extraction methods shown in the graph. Again, the FFP curls extracted were all Horizon FFP reference standards, and this time the DNA extractions were quantified using the qubit, which is another fluorometric assay. The N number in this data refers to the number of labs employing this particular, that particular method. 
And as you can see, the results demonstrate that the Kyogen EZ1 automated platform has the lowest yield variance with a CV of 52%, and the Kyogen Kyam had the highest CV. So the take-home message from this slide would be that this highlights that different extraction methods can have different levels of variability across multiple samples. So on the next slide, this data set was also externally generated from the same study as the previous slide. This figure shows the average nanodrop to qubit ratio for each one of the 13 laboratories that participated, as well as, on the very far right-hand side, the average and the median ratio for the entire co cohort. And what you can see is that the correlation between the nanodrop and the qubit measurements for the, all the samples was poor, with an R squared of 0.48 and a p-value of less than 0.0001. As the graph shows, the medium nanodrop readings were 5.1-fold higher than the qubit measurements for the same samples. And obviously, if they measured the same, the nanodrop to qubit ratio would be 1. What's important to take home from this slide is that for every participating lab, the nanodrop over-quantified the DNA concentration compared to the qubit reading. So, Analyzing the cause of a failed assay is a particular challenge for labs that are not used to handling FFP samples or for labs that are using quantification methodologies that tend to overestimate the, the amount of DNA in a sample when they're measuring a sample that has quite a low DNA concentration of less than 10 to 20 nanograms per microliter. So as a quick comparison of the different methodologies, Spectrophotometry is very accurate for samples um, that are above 10 to 20 nanograms per microliter. And an additional advantage of this is that they, it can be used to con uh, confirm contamination with protein or RNA. In comparison, fluorometry-based methods are suitable for DNA concentrations far below 10 nanograms per microliter, but on the other hand, can be inaccurate for very highly concentrated samples. However, fluorometry methods can also be used for both high molecular weight and um, fragmented DNA samples. So I'd say, in summary, <coughs> excuse me, the different extraction methods can result in varying DNA yields from the same starting material. Secondly, we know that the nanodrop is very efficient at quantifying DNA at high concentrations, but we've also shown that at low concentrations, below around 10 nanograms per microliter, that spectrophotometry methods can overestimate the DNA concentration compared with fluorometri fluorometry quantification methods. And I'd say that all these factors have important implications on the diagnostic test, particularly, as Jonathan al already gave you an example of, with false negatives. So then what I wanted to, to bring around was then uh, sort of a bit more data, both externally and internally, of using our reference standards. So this, sli this slide here is, is from, is from the, the paper that uh, Vicky's referenced earlier. And what, it, what, I was, what I'm trying to highlight here is so it's, it's looking at the total DNA that's recovered from different samples by participants. And so seven of the samples are, uh, are, do come from Horizon and are validated cell line reference standards. They're the ones in green. And then there's the one sample that is a, a clinical sample. And whilst the, every, um, uh, the lab that was distributed in the clinical sample did, did uh, attempt to keep the, 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 the each sample as consistent as possible between, uh, between vials, it's very clear that when you try and ex extract DNA from clinical samples, there's a great variability on DNA recovery. And that could be, that could be attributed to the sample prep. It could also be attributed to the, mm -hmm. the DNA quantification. Wherever the wherever the variability creeps in, it's it's a it, it, along with other factors is a, is a critical property of, of clinical samples that suggest they, they shouldn't they can't and shouldn't be used as external controls for truly understanding uh, the, the pre analytical as well as part as well as the analytical side of your assay, and in, in contrast, I think this is where validated cell line reference standards. Can, can prove to be very useful as external controls is there's, there's much tighter concordance between labs with each sample shown by, shown by this, this uh, data set. 
And what we wanted to do based on based on this was also then start to so we then took this is the internal data. Was from from the data out there we we've always asked the question, okay, what is the impact of formula fixation on assay performance? And it can it can impact both the pre-analytical side as well as the analytical. And we we had a we did actually have a webinar that's, that is available on, on our website last month about how the, how formula fixation can impact the analytical side. Now, what we've got, what's important on the pre-analytical is so on the left-hand side of this graph, the first three uh, three data sets is where we've we've looked at the the DNA concentration uh, from three from our from three uh, three samples three batches of samples where we've treated the treated the, treated the cells with mild formalin fixation. The, we've then taken the same number of cells and then uh, undergone a severe formalin fixation step. And what you can see very clearly is while we know that in uh, the theoretical DNA yield, for, yield from both and also the concentration from both should be consistent between mild versus severe, the nanodrop, which is the gray bars versus qubit, um, well, well overestimates the, the actual DNA that's in the tube. And so this would then the knock-on effect is, as, as Vicky mentioned, uh, you would then you would under you would end up underloading the amount of material into your analytical step, and so there is a potential of getting false negatives in your results. Now, what we've tried to what we've been developing to to try and push push this um, push this further and, and support into the field is looking at how how you can test the, both the robustness and the sensitivity of your assay or workflow. And so what I've got here is a, is a quadrant where we can start in the top right. So we, we, do, we, have, we do have um, the availability of DNA reference standards, either as a, as a single SNP, say KRSG 13D, or as a multiplex SNP, which is very useful if you're, you're running next generation sequencing assays. That DNA, that DNA in the top right is, is direct from the cell line, so it's very clean, it's very very easy to use, and it will it will, it will help to uh, tell you the, the the true limit detection of your assay. We then we then moved into uh, the, so we moved to the top left side of the, the quadrant. This is where we we've developed formally compromised reference standards provided as DNA, and so within the within the tube you would get you would get DNA, and we we currently are uh, we've got an early release product available. One is with mild formula fixation, which is the C6, C, the HDC 750, and one is with the severe formula intensity, which is the HDC 751. And with this, you can you can really start to test and see whether or not the, the formula fixation actually has an impact on well, firstly your the DNA quantification, and then also the the uh, analytical side of your workflow as well, and whether or not that's uh, the formula fixation. Could be attributed to false negatives in in your workflow in your in your assay, and then the true I guess the, then the, the final quadrant so at the bottom left is the true process control, and so this is where we provide we provide exactly the same material as an FFP section where you can go through the DNA extraction, go through the DNA quantification, and then put it onto the analytical side of your workflow to test how sensitive and how robust your workflow is. What's really nice, and it's, it's in, inherent in, in our approach, is every each one of these tubes has got on on this for these these couple of numbers has exactly the same genotype, and so we've all we've done is actually just change the the format that we provide it to you with, and so there's only one variable that is different between each of the, the quadrants, whether it's um, clean DNA versus formal and compromised DNA versus uh, FFB sections. I'd be very happy to, to uh, talk more about these uh, in a more one-to-one -one, uh, situation with you if you're you're interested. And we always have we always have our, our live chats uh, up and running on our website, and so you can you can always tap into our our scientists and uh, te technical scientists to talk more about these particular these particular reference standards. And so that's a, it. Then comes back back round to the to the question I was, I was asking at the start. And what is the impact of assay failure in your laboratory, and how do you monitor for it? 
now f where we've where we've come from over the last four years as a, as a as a division within Horizon, we've we've pushed boundaries with the quality assurance schemes. We've been working with a number of a number of these different schemes. We've been working with a number of partners as that that uh, are developing companion diagnostic kits. And what we what we are what we are really driving forward is validated sound and reference standards are ideal as external controls. And then the next questions to, to put out there to you is what what, quant what extraction and quantification methods are you using? What is the limit of detection of your workflow? And is the impact of form and treatment an interesting variable for you to, to look at? I think if, if you are asking yourselves any of those questions, I'd like to think that we'd be able to support you as, as you move forward um, in your particular in, in your laboratories. 